Coming up on Primetime News, Seoul broadcasts anti-Pyongyang propaganda messages over the border for the first time in 11 years after North Korean landmines maimed two South Korean soldiers last week. President Park Geun-hye speaks on several issues today, from voicing regret about North Korea's decision to change its time zone to urging Japan to acknowledge past wrongdoings. Plus, Japanese media disagree on whether Prime Minister Shinzo Abe will include an apology in his upcoming statement, marking the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello and welcome to Primetime News on this Monday, August 10th. I'm Huang Jie. And I'm Daniel Chen. Thank you for joining us. Let us begin with the latest incident causing a further rift in inter-Korean relations. Seoul's defense ministry says Pyongyang is responsible for landmine explosions at the heavily fortified demilitarized zone last week that seriously injured two South Korean soldiers. And of course, South Korea vows to retaliate. Our Kim Yeon bin starts us off. The defense ministry said Monday that debris from the mines was recovered after a thorough survey of the site, and they've concluded that the debris is from a PMD series mine. This device is identical to the kinds of landmines typically used by Pyongyang. The Joint Chiefs of Staff has condemned North Korea for its actions. These acts by Pyongyang violate the armistice agreement and the non-aggression pact. We urge North Korea to apologize for its provocations and punish those involved. As we have previously warned, we will make Pyongyang pay dearly for its provocations. It's believed that North Korean soldiers crossed a military demarcation line late last month to lay the mines, which were planted around a gate guarded by the South Korean military that opens to the DMZ. There are limitations with the surveillance equipment alone, so we usually conduct searches and lie in wait. But this incident happened during a regular operation. Military officials say that North Korea may have planted the mines ahead of a possible incursion into the south and to derail an annual round of military drills between Seoul and Washington, slated for next week. The United Nations Command has condemned North Korea for its actions and reiterated its stance that the armistice agreement should be maintained. It's also planning to propose a general officer-level dialogue with North Korea to discuss the incident. Kim Hyun bin Arirang News. Soon after the harsh rhetoric against North Korea, South Korea began blasting loudspeakers at the border. Seoul is broadcasting anti-Pyongyang propaganda across the DMZ for the first time in more than a decade, as both sides boost their defenses in case of tension es escalate. Civilians nearby have been advised to evacuate for their safety. Our Song ji reports. South Korea's defense ministry said it began broadcasting the messages today at two spots along the border. The propaganda criticizes the communist regime while encouraging North Koreans to defect to the democratic and capitalist South. South Korea removed the speakers in 2004 after an agreement between Seoul and Pyongyang. But the South reinstalled them in 2010 after the North torpedoed the South Korean warship Chonan, killing 46 sailors. The broadcast campaign isn't exactly an eye-for-an-eye an eye retaliation, as promised by the South Korean government, but Seoul's defense ministry says it's considered the most effective method for now. The ministry said the North fears psychological warfare, a tactic in which Pyongyang considers itself weak. The North has said it would shoot down the loudspeakers if the South used them again. Seoul's defense ministry has boosted its defenses in case Pyongyang attacks the speakers. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. So just how did these wooden box mines go undetected and when could have North Korea planted them in South Korea's side of the heavily fortified DMZ? Our Connie Kim explains. The North Korean landmines that exploded were just 22 centimeters long, 4.5 centimeters high and 9 centimeters wide. With a force of 10 kilograms or less, they can blow off automatically, injuring or possibly even killing those within a two-meter range. 
Encased in wood, the explosives can be hard to detect. Seoul's defense ministry said low visibility and heavy brush at the accident site also would have made it difficult to track any secret enemy movements. The explosion site is a densely wooded area, and if it rains, barely anything can be seen. Surveillance devices might not even be able to detect anything. Video footage of the blast site does not clearly show any North Korean soldiers crossing the military demarcation line or suspicious movements around a nearby South Korean army guarded gate. Seoul, however, says its conclusion is backed by strong evidence. We collected 37 pieces of mine debris. The paint found on these fragments are identical to that of North Korea's wooden box mines and have a strong pine resin scent. The pine resin is one of the most distinct clues that directly points to North Korea. It's similar to another wooden box mine found in 2010. Three spring parts and a trinitrotoluene explosive material, or TNT, were also cited as clear evidence. Although the exact timing of when Pyongyang buried the mines is unknown, it's believed North Korean soldiers secretly laid the mines between July 23rd and August 3rd, a day before the explosion. Military officials say 10 minutes is all it takes to complete a landmine burial operation. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Ahead of the 70th anniversary of Korea's Liberation Day celebration this Saturday, there's been more incidents to dampen the festive mood in South Korea other than the landmine explosions. Pyongyang's decision to change its time zone appears to be hindering Seoul's efforts to bring the two Koreas closer together. Our Choi Yusan has more. President Park Geun-hye has expressed deep regret that North Korea has decided to create its own time zone without discussing the matter with South Korea. At a meeting of her senior secretaries on Monday, President Park said she's concerned the time change could further widen the gap between the two Koreas. Last week, the North State News Agency said the regime will set its clocks back 30 minutes starting August 15th, the 70th anniversary of Korea's liberation from Japanese colonial rule at the end of World War II. The two Koreas were one country at the time Japan annexed the Korean Peninsula, and since then the local time has been the same in the two Koreas and Japan. The news agency said Japanese imperialists robbed the peninsula of its own time zone during colonization in order to impose their own. Seoul, on the other hand, says it's keeping the current standard time in accordance with international practice. From the perspective of the 70th anniversary of Korea's liberation and the division of the two Koreas, President Park said Pyongyang's time change actually hampers Seoul's efforts to narrow the differences between the two and revive inter-Korean dialogue. 북한이 우리의 대화와 협력 제안에는 아무런 반응도 하지 않으면서 시간대마저 분리시키는 것은 남북 협력과 평화 통일 노력에 역행하는 역행하는 것이자 the South Korean government expects some short-term inconvenience at the joint Kaesong Industrial Complex in the north and long-term problems if and when the two sides have to agree on standards in preparation for reunification. Choi Yusan, Arirang News. Switching over to Korea-Japan relations, a long overdue gesture may come from Tokyo. In his upcoming World War II statement set to be released on Friday, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe could include key words used by his predecessors on Tokyo's wartime past. Our Hwang Sung-hee has the details. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe could use terms like apology and aggression in his statement to mark the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. Citing an unnamed senior government official, NHK reported Monday that Abe may repeat key words used in the Murayama statement released in 1995. That year, former Japanese Prime Minister Tomichi Murayama had expressed feelings of deep remorse and offered a heartfelt apology to mark the 50th anniversary of Japan's surrender. Murayama also acknowledged that Tokyo had inflicted tremendous damage and suffering in Asia through its colonial rule and aggression. Monday's NHK report is a bit more optimistic than previous reports by Japanese media outlets.
The Asai Shimbun reported last week that while Abe reiterated that he would inherit as a whole the statements by his predecessors, the draft of his version did not include the word apology to Asian countries for Japan's role in the war, nor the phrases colonial rule and aggression. Whatever is in the Abe statement will have a huge influence on Korea-Japan relations. Seoul and Beijing, the major victims of Japan's wartime aggression, are closely watching the statements, which will be released Friday. But some say the content will largely depend on the primary audience that Abe has in mind. If his statement is targeted toward Japan's Asian neighbors and the victims of its wartime aggression, the Japanese leader will uphold the Murayama statement. But if he is planning to direct the address to his domestic audience, he may choose to focus on Japan's post-war recovery rather than apologizing for the country's wartime past. Hwang sang Arirang News. While all eyes are focused on whether Abe will weasel his way out of an apology this time, President Park Geun-hye once again urged the Japanese government to acknowledge its wartime history. For more on this story, we turn to our Park ji President Park Geun-hye says she hopes Japan will take a mature stance on its wartime history for a fresh start on relations with its neighbors. The president made the comment during a regular meeting with her senior secretaries Monday. She also offered her condolences to the family of a woman who passed away last Saturday in the U.S. and who was a survivor of Japan's wartime sexual slavery program. The president expressed her sorrow and apologized for not being able to heal the wounds of history for the 93-year-old and for failing to restore her honor and dignity. President Park also expressed concern that this year, which marks the 70th anniversary of Korea's liberation from Japan's colonial rule, will be the last chance to resolve the matter. Eight women who were enslaved by Japan during wartime have passed away in this year alone, leaving only 47 alive out of the 238 women registered by the government. Analysts see the president's comments as another attempt to pressure Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to include an apology in an upcoming statement to mark the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. Meanwhile, the president's office also said it's reviewing whether President Park should attend an event in China on September 3rd, marking the anniversary. The president's office has denied Japanese media reports that U.S. officials asked the Korean leader not to attend the ceremonies, calling them groundless. The White House has also denied the report. On Sunday, Japan's Kyoto News reported Washington made the request through a diplomatic channel. The president's office is expected to make a decision after further deliberation and said it would take into account what Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says in his statement expected on Friday. Park ji Arirang News. Lawmakers have set the agenda for a parliamentary vote slated for tomorrow. During the session, lawmakers will vote on pending economy-related bills and resolutions to overhaul Korea's disease management system. They will also conduct a special audit of government bodies deemed responsible for the MERS outbreak. Also today, lawmakers set an end date of August 31st for the current parliamentary session and agreed to extend the term of a special special parliamentary committee tasked with supporting the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics and another on housing assistance for working class people. They will also continue to discuss the scandal surrounding the nation's spy agency. And the country's two main rival parties have agreed to discuss reforming elections after talks came to halt last week. Their discussions will take place at the committee level. The ruling Senori party has agreed to consider a scheme proposed by the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy in which the NPAD would be allowed to create a new electoral system in exchange for implementing the ruling party's idea for an open primary. At the upcoming talks, the ruling party plans to suggest an open primary system that allows independent voters to support candidates from any party. Under the proposed system, the country would be divided into multiple electoral zones and parliamentary seats would be allocated according to the percentage of votes obtained by each party in each area. 
Let's focus on Chebels and hot waters. Multiple investigations are now underway on Korea's fifth largest business conglomerate, Lotte Group. The group's cloudy corporate structure and allegations of possible tax evasions were all partly brought to light by the recent feud within the founder's family. Our Shin Zemin reports. A thorough investigation into retail giant Lotte Group is picking up ahead of steam. Korea's Fair Trade Commission and the Financial Supervisory Service have separately requested Lotte Group provide them with related information. They are looking into Lotte's complicated governing structure and possible tax evasion in light of the nasty family feud within the founder's family. On top of that, the National Tax Service has been leading an investigation into Taehong Communications, the group's affiliated advertisement firm. But Lotte Group has claimed that probe is a separate issue, as it began last month before the family feud kicked off. The NTS is believed to be studying related data on the group's advertisement arm as Lotte Hotel, the de facto holding company of the group's Korean business units, owns a controlling stake of 12.8 percent in the firm. The tax agency's probe has led to speculation the NTS may be looking into other parts of the group, not just a communications firm. Lotte Group's recent revelation of its opaque governance structure could even lead to a creation of a new law. The main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy and a dozen other minor party members have proposed a bill called the Lotte Law. It would be aimed at stopping conglomerates from seeking loopholes in cross shareholdings through controlling overseas affiliates. Shin Zemin, Arirang News. Let's shift gears now. What better way to ensure security than using parts of your body as the key? The market for technology that relies on recognition, recognizing parts of the human body water to grant access is growing and growing. Our Kim Min-ji informs us of the potential of this fascinating industry. You may have seen high-tech tools that scan your eyes or fingerprints in the movies, but the technology known as biometric authentication is gradually becoming part of our daily lives. This company uses facial recognition to identify workers, allow them into the building and track their attendance. It only takes a second to verify and match the person's face with the stored data. Not only is it convenient, but it's more secure as people's unique facial features are almost impossible to replicate. But it's not just businesses using the tech, apartment complexes are also adopting the system. Entering your home is going to get a lot much easier. You'll no longer need keys or even need to press in a passcode. This facial recognition system makes your house more secure and completely hassle-free. Biometric authentication is gaining popularity as a new means of identification, replacing the predominant system of numerical or text passwords. The global market is expected to reach 16.7 billion U.S. dollars by 2019, more than a threefold increase since 2012. The growth comes on the back of the rise of fintech or financial technology that requires a high level of security as it becomes easier to make payments. Technology that can read your eyes is also being developed. With iris recognition, users can worry less about their identity being falsely used. Iris is very unique, and even twins have different iris characteristics. In just a blink of an eye, a transaction can be made simply by looking into a device. A local card company is planning to implement this system to make transactions easier. But like all other previous methods of identification, biometric security features come with risks. Strong measures need to be taken to prevent biometric data leaks. If it's being stored, it means it can be leaked. Passwords can be reset and cards can be reissued if lost. But biometric features cannot be changed. There are also doubts whether the new authentication systems will become widely used as people may be uncomfortable having their biometric information saved on a database. Kim min Arirang News.
And for top international headlines, we turn to our Yi Sun at the News Center. Today's focus, gunshots are fired at the one-year commemoration of the fatal shooting of Michael Brown. Turkey is rocked by deadly attacks and Singapore celebrates its 50th anniversary. Well, Sano, let's start off in Ferguson. What exactly happened there? Well, what started off as a peaceful rally marking the one-year anniversary of the death of Michael Brown took a turn for the worse as gunfire erupted, leaving two injured. The shots were heard at dusk as demonstrators approached riot police lines. Dozens of protesters were seen blocking traffic and smashing windows as tensions began to escalate. A gunman then opened fire on police, which led to a shootout, leaving one bystander injured and the shooter in critical condition. Uh, he engaged the uh, officers at the time. There were four officers who were in that van. All four fired at the suspect, and the suspect uh, fell there. Suspect is in a local hospital. He is in critical, unstable condition in surgery. The fatal shooting of Brown, an unarmed black teen by a white policeman last year, sparked months of protests and a national debate on race and justice. And continue on with some unfortunate news. Turkey saw a bloody day on Monday as police headquarters in Istanbul were targeted in a blast, followed by an attack on the U.S. consulate and an assault on a military helicopter. A vehicle filled with explosive was used in a police station attack on Monday, injuring three officers and seven civilians. Two assailants were killed in retaliatory fire by police, which left one more officer dead. Now, just hours later, on the other side of the city, two other women opened fire on the U.S. consulate. One of the shooters has been captured. Not only this, in southern Turkey, PKK militants assaulted a military helicopter using an anti-aircraft gun. Turkey has already increased its state of alert before this latest wave of violence. Earlier last month, 30 people were killed in a suspected IS suicide bombing in a Kurdish town near the Syrian border. And lastly, ending on a high note, turning to Singapore, the nation celebrated its 50th anniversary over the weekend in style. This year's National Day Parade depicted the city-state's history under the theme Forward Singapore. Thousands of spectators gathered for the extravagant festivities, which included a fighter jet air show and fireworks. Um, actually very emotional because when I step out of my house, I look at the things around me and I find that all these things have been achieved over, uh, with a lot of effort over these past 50 years and I hope. This is the second time this year that Singaporeans have gathered together to celebrate the incredible success of their small nation. Earlier in March, they mourned the passing of their first Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew. And that does it for your international news at this hour. I'll see you again tomorrow. It was another hot but bearable day. In fact, heat wave alerts have finally been lifted across the peninsula. But the hot conditions will continue here in Seoul. But elsewhere, highs should be a bit cooler tomorrow. Thanks to heavier clouds and rain hovering over the southern regions, we can expect highs to drop a few degrees on Tuesday. And these showers will continue into Wednesday for most parts. Jeju and areas along the southern coast lines will get up to 70 millimeters. But here in the capital and the surrounding areas will remain under partly sunny skies. But good news, the extreme heat is definitely tapering off and it might have come to an end for the season. Temperatures should return to summer averages by Wednesday and by next week they should drop down to 20s. But tomorrow, daily high here in the capital will soar to 32, while Taegui and Busan top out at 31 and Gwangju will see a high of 30. And as for the other regions, uh, Daejeon and Jeju Island will get up to 30, while Tokyo rises to 28. Now, along with the cooling trend, we can also be the farewell to sleepless tropical nights very soon. Well, that's all for the weather. Good night.
I guess students in that school won't mind staying in school extra time after the class is over. Well, that brings us to the end of our newscast. Thank you so much for staying with us. We'll be back tomorrow, same time. Goodbye for now.